Hello. I hope you're all doing well. Um, let me get the, our PowerPoint up. Today we're going to talk about the most important concept in what is orthodox or neoclassical economics. Um, if you had economics before, then you're familiar with this. Um, you may even be familiar with it um, if you're just kind of a regular person who goes around and doing things in life. Because the idea that we're going to talk about today of marginal utility um, is not only the central concept in orthodox economics, um, but it's also in, you know, has a certain intuitive appeal. And I think um, it's entered into you know, common um, understanding of the world. Um, within economics, uh, the earliest case that I've seen and people who study this probably um, know better um, is, in, is among the so-called Ricardian socialists, a group of, of uh, English radical economists in the 1820s and 30s, followers of the great English economist, David Ricardo. Um, and their ideas found their way into Karl Marx's writings. Um, uh, and they used uh, diminishing marginal utility as an argument for redistributing income from the rich to the poor or from the rich to the working classes. Um, we will talk about this much more later when we discuss income distribution and theory utilitarianism. Um, uh, from there, the idea was picked up. And I shouldn't say from there because I, I don't, this isn't my area and I'm not sure if there is a direct link. But the next major use of the idea was 30, 40 years later in William Jevons, English economist, um, and then more formally worked out in Léon Valras, the great French economist. Um, and Jevons and Valras were working to develop ID economic analysis to counter Marxism and socialism. Um, uh, they were explicitly anti-Marxist. Um, so they were making a break with the classical economics of David Ricardo, which uh, of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, which had found its way into Karl Marx. Um, and they wanted to found economics on a different basis. And the basis they found was diminishing marginal utility. From diminishing, and diminishing marginal utility became the basis of the theory of demand and the theory of price. But of course, you can't just do it with a demand curve. You also need a supply curve, as the another great English economist, um, uh, Marshall, uh, Alfred Marshall, um, found. Um, and Marshall argued that you need a scissors, you need demand, and you need supply. Uh, theory of supply came out of diminishing marginal productivity, applying diminishing marginal utility to the production process. I mean, obviously, it's not quite so simple, as we'll talk about. Um, but this idea of diminishing marginal is a really popular idea among orthodox economists. It is the basis of orthodox economics. Um, and uh, uh, there's a certain diminishing, okay, nothing on my phone. Okay, um, so let us move on. Okay, uh, oh yeah, the first discussions do Wednesday, what is economics about? Um, uh, and then, you know, the introductory lectures, et cetera. Okay, and there are various readings, chapter three, which is about diminishing marginal utility. There's an extra video focusing on diminishing marginal utility. 
um, and their discussions. Okay, marginal utility. <clears throat> Why the individual's demand curves are often downward sloping. I say often because they're not always going to be downward sloping. Um, if you had economics in high school or if you had economics in most other places, they would tell you they're always downward sloping, but that doesn't make any sense. And if you push a, an orthodox economy, it's not the mediocre, you know, people, you know, in some place, but you know, you go to a good place, a good school with smart people, um, and you push them about it, they'll say, yeah, of course there are cases where it's not downward sloping. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they'll go, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and by the time you're done with all, yeah, all the yeah, yeahs, as we'll talk about in the next lecture, you start to wonder, is there any place where you can say they're downward sloping? Uh, but, you know, um, you know, you pile up the exceptions and you start saying, what happened to the rule? There are all these exceptions, they're not proving the rule, whatever that means, it never makes any sense either. But the, you know, these exceptions aren't proving the rule, they're contradicting the rule. Um, and that's why I say often and whatever that means. Two cats. Um, God, where do we have, I guess, oh, that's my, uh, I think that is my younger daughter's um, bed some time ago and two cats. She, uh, <laughs> she accumulates cats. Um, poodles, as you'll gather if you haven't yet. I am completely enamored of poodles. Uh, let's see, right here, I've got a little poodle, stuffed poodle. Here we go, the poodle. My poodle, um, Corduroy, is sleeping as he usually does when I'm lecturing. Um, he's boring. Yeah. He finds me boring. Um, so do my kids. They would talk about, oh, dad's professing again. <laughs> yeah. How many dogs? Why do I only have one? Why don't I have two? Since I love poodles so much, why don't I have three? I have a stuffed poodle. I've got several stuffed poodles, and I've got other poodle paraphernalia around, but I've got only one living poodle. That's kind of sad, but okay. Corduroy, his sister, had 11 puppies. Quite a puppy pile. There she is. Oh. Why didn't I get one of them? Uh, the breeder puts a ribbon, a colored ribbon on the different poodles so she can tell them apart. Um, we've discussed this a lot. Um, given my health conditions, I think it's out. Um, but, uh, oh, okay, big picture. We get pleasure from things. That's why we buy them or make them, whatever. But we get sated, uh, you, know, you know, we're not getting too much into the source of the pleasure. We did that last time when we talked about, you know, does GDP make us happy? Um, but, you know, we do get sated as we have more and more. Um, and we get less and less additional pleasure the more we already have. This is diminishing marginal utility. Marginal utility is the pleasure we get from one more of whatever it is. So the pleasure I get from, if I have no poodles, the marginal utility for the first poodle would be the happiness I have from one poodle. Marginal utility from the second poodle would be the change in happiness. How much more happiness do I get? Third poodle, how much more happiness? That's my marginal utility of the third poodle, marginal utility of the fourth poodle. How much more happiness do I have with four poodles compared with three poodles? And the basic idea here is that that marginal utility is diminishing. Because of this, we will buy more only at an ever decreasing price because my second poodle is not as big a deal as the first one. So I'll buy it, but yeah, only if it's cheaper. Third one, only if it's cheaper. Fourth one, only if it's cheaper. And my individual demand curve, how much I'm willing to pay for different quantities is downward sloping. I'll pay more for fewer poodles. I'll buy more poodles only at a lower price because of diminishing marginal utility. 
Now, in the Orthodox model, they say, okay, you've got this. And you, you know, this is in textbooks that you had in high school. Or if you were at Amherst College, this is the textbook that you'd be using, it would say, okay, you know, this is how it's true of an individual. So if you want to know the community, just multiply it by the number of people in the community. This requires an extreme assumption that each individual's marginal utility is independent of what other people are doing. Extreme assumption of independence of individual choice. It is not, it's not only extreme, but it's wrong. We all know it's false. I'm more willing to have poodles if my neighbors have dogs and can play together. Just think of a simple example. Yeah, so, um, okay. Marginal utility diminishes because of satiation. The extra pleasure we get from consuming one more thing and it diminishes because we become sated. We've had enough. Um, I've got a pile of chocolate. Give me more chocolate? Yeah, sure, but I, I'm, I've had, kind of had enough chocolate. Marginal utility diminishes. The more you have, the less you want more. The first time is great. The second time is wonderful. Third time is really good. The fourth time, it's sweet and it's so nice that you wanted to do it. The fifth time, don't touch me anymore. I've had enough. Yeah. Things are less exciting when you've had enough. enough. Even sex, drugs, oh boy. <laughs> Rock and roll. You know, you get to a point where your ears start to. Now, this will vary by people. And there's a concept of hedonic adjustment that relates to how quickly you get bored of things. Um, my wife and I have found, we've been together for 50 years, um, we found that we have very different hedonic adjustments. It's kind of interesting, I think. Um, she has a very quick hedonic adjustment. She gets tired of things very quickly. So walking the dog, um, she will walk him one place, maybe again the next day, but then she wants to go someplace else. Me, I have a very, very slow hedonic adjustment. I'm perfectly comfortable having exactly the same thing for breakfast every day. Um, and sometimes if I don't have it, I feel you know, deprived. It, it actually it, it does change during the summer, uh, but whatever. Okay. Um, but walking the dog, I will walk the dog the same place every day. I do it year after year. Um, I find it comforting. Uh, I don't get bored. Um, the same with music. Um, you know, I brush the dog down in the basement. We have a grooming table. I brush the dog every night. Um, and I will go for long periods where I'm always listening to the same music while brushing the dog. Um, I mean, it. I will change, you know, but... Um, Dire Straits, Romeo and Juliet, I listened to that. You know, uh, for a while I was on Adele. Um, and I, you know, I will listen to covers um, of the same music. My wife, she needs a constant um, flow of new music. Yeah, I mean, there's some music, Joni Mitchell's and classics that she loves, but um, she needs new music adjustment. Um, I will go to the same restaurant, order the same thing. She, we've been here before. Let's try something else. Let's try something new. Okay, so her diminishing marginal utility slips down much more steeply than mine. Mine may be flat. <laughs> you know. Okay, would you have a tire? Think about it. Could, would you get tired of chocolate? Um, looks like grandma over there smoking pot. You get tired of that? It's legal. Um, <clears throat> listen, 
for some of you, wine is probably still illegal. Um, love. Don't forget your old friends here. Okay. How many times have you read the Harry Potter books or seen the movies? Um, I think the most I've ever had in any of my classes was somebody had read them sort of 11 times, but she had gotten to a point where she would just be skipping around. She had things memorized. So um, as for the movies, uh, I don't, maybe I should do a survey. Yeah, I don't know how many times. Um, the Hunger Games, The Lord of the Rings. Um, my younger daughter has seen The Lord of the Rings movies and read the books in several languages. Um, <laughs> she has the fellowship in Latin. Um, and uh, how many times has she, she couldn't count the number of times she's read them or seen them. Um, uh, she was visiting in May of this year and uh, um, we settled into a serious um, review of the Star Wars movies. Um, movies, TV shows, starting from the very beginning, the earliest prequels, and keep it going all the way through. It was kind of interesting. It didn't change my views, although I had never seen Obi-Wan Kenobi, um, which I much enjoyed. Um, the Mandalorian I had seen. Um, okay, anyway. Um, did I enjoy the Star Wars movies? Some of them was like the fourth or fifth time I had seen them. Um, some of them didn't, I didn't get tired of. Lord of the Rings movies, I do not get tired of. Um, Hunger Games, yeah, I get tired of. You know, Harry Potter, mm, I'm not gonna tell you my opinion. <laughs> you know, okay, diminishing modern utility from rereading Harry Potter. How much pleasure do you get from the Harry Potter series? We, we can kind of think of this, how much would you pay to have the Harry Potter series in the universe with you six hundred thousand dollars whatever so you can say six hundred dollars you can say sixty dollars i don't care the point is from how much would you pay to be able to read them twice it's going to be less almost certain not always not always but for most people it will be less and keep on going eighth time presumably a lot more this is hedonic adjustment. This is diminishing modular utility. And this is your diminishing demand curve for the Harry Potter books. Game of Thrones. Oh, God, talk about backwash. I have never seen anything where the ending was so, so horrible and it's corrupted the whole thing. I don't want to have anything to do with the Game of Thrones again because. The ending was so bad. If you feel differently or you agree with me, write to me. Come to my office hours. We can talk about it. Um, oh, baby Yoda, I think it's like the cutest thing in the world. <laughs> oh, sorry. Six times. I think I need to update that. Um, okay, graph of diminishing modular utility from a glass of wine. You know, first glass, you may, oh, God, thank heavens. It's been a long day. I needed something. And, you know, you're sitting there with your friend. Second glass, you're playing darts with your friend. Do you remember Ted Lasso where he plays darts with, uh, what's her name's ex? Oh, uh, that, I, I, actually, I think that is maybe the best thing in Ted Lasso. Um, I'm sorry they did the second season. It really, except for the, I loved the Christmas episode because I am such a softy. But okay, diminishing margarine utility, second glass, not as much fun. Third, and you get the sixth glass is like, okay, I'll drink it if it's free, but I'm not going to pay for it. And the seventh glass, don't, don't do this. Don't, don't. I know it's a rite of passage type thing for college students or people that, but don't. Um, even if the drinks are free, stop. How much will you pay? Well, first glass, you'll pay $20. Second glass, 
1750. The third glass, you would be willing to pay $15. That's your demand curve. This is how much you're willing to pay for different quantities of wine. You get to the sixth glass, you'll buy six gla sixth glass only if it's free. And the seventh glass, they have to pay you. They have to pay you to go through this. You know, so you'll drink that glass if they pay you seven fifty or whatever it is. How many glasses of wine will you drink? Well, if it's fifteen dollars a glass, you'll drink the first one. Yeah, it's worth twenty dollars to you. It only costs fifteen. Great. Second glass, it's worth seventeen fifty. It only costs fifteen. Great. Third glass, you'll drink it, but that's the end of it. Fifth, it's worth fifteen. They charge fifteen. Okay. Fourth glass, no way. You're not going to drink the fourth glass. The fourth glass, you only get eleven dollars of pleasure. They're charging fifteen. Where do you think I am? Chop liver? I'm not doing it. That's your demand curve. I could say your faux demand curve because it's a demand curve for you as an individual. What happens if you're with friends? If you have somebody to play darts with? If you, my wife's not big on wine, but she does enjoy it if we get a good bottle of wine and she sits down and we can discuss it. She, she enjoys discussing quality wine. How, is this more fruity? Her favorite is if we get three or four bottles and we do a, sam, a sampling. Um, but uh, otherwise, she's not big on, on wine. Um, your individual demand curve for wine is downward sloping. You'll buy more only at a lower price. But if you're with a friend, the whole thing may be different. You know, um, two glasses of wine means that you and your friend are going to be playing darts. So all of a sudden, that second glass, it's more fun than the first one. If there are a whole bunch of you, then you know, you're having a party. The third glass may be the most fun because that's the point where you start dancing. Maybe the fourth and fifth glasses, you start having diminishing marginal utility, but for a while it can be upward sloping for sure, if you're in a group. So as an individual, downward sloping, diminishing marginal utility. Once you get a community involved, it may be all very different. Um, now, of course, it's not true of everything. There are products with upward sloping marginal utility. Some of them are really bad. Um, and, you know, in all seriousness, don't, don't, you know, um, you know, I mean, if you have chronic pain conditions, you know, certain medical conditions, then yeah, opiates, good. I mean, you know, all sorts of drugs can have a place, but no, generally don't, don't go do this on your own, please. Because once you get started, you may get more and more pleasure. How do we know that most things have diminishing marginal utility? Think about it. What happens to people um, who get involved with heroin? Eventually, that's all they do. You know, there's this heroin chic thing in late, nine, late 20th century, especially in, among models in London, shishi communities in New York, um, you know, where people wouldn't eat anything. They became really thin because all they did was heroin, um, you know, or cocaine. You know, and eventually you spend, why do, you, why do they do this? Why are they spending more and more of their money on this one product? Because there's upward sloping marginal utility. If you find a product with upward sloping marginal utility, that's what you're gonna do. You'll buy some, then A, it's so much fun and it's still at that price. So I'm gonna buy more. It's even more fun. I'm gonna buy more. I'm gonna buy more. And eventually, a product with upward sloping marginal utility will be the only thing that people consume. So we know that most things have downward sloping marginal utility eventually, because there are very few products that where consumers act this way. 
for those products, gambling, drugs, alcohol, we generally have uh, legal restrictions. We have programs in schools that teach people not to use them, <sighs> whatever. Um, but that's because they have up with silicon margarine utility and people will stop eating if that's the product they get involved with. Uh, there are things that have up with silicon margarine utility for at least a while. You know, you may enjoy more for a time because you learn how. Wine is one of those. You know, if you develop a taste, if you learn to distinguish the flavors, uh, we take children to museums to teach them to get them on an upward sloping margarine utility for fine art. So they develop a discriminating eye, so they appreciate good art. We take children to um, theater. Uh, we make you read Shakespeare um, and Sophocles. Um, so that you will develop a taste for the better stuff in life. Uh, because we feel that those things have a put sloping margin utility, at least for a while. But there are very few people who devote everything to Shakespeare, James Joyce, or the Greek tragedies. Um, you know, I love Sophocles as much as anybody, but I do other things in life than um, uh, Karl Marx would reread all of the Greek tragedies, at least all of Sophocles. Um, maybe it was all of Aeschylus. Maybe it was all of Aeschylus and Sophocles. I don't think it was Europeans or <laughs> whatever. Anyway, Karl Marx would reread them every year. Um, and I can understand that. I don't do that, but I kind of wish I would because, you know, um, you can really appreciate things um, as you consume more of them. Sex is like that. You know, first time is usually the first time when you're a virgin and the first time with someone else, a new partner is usually not so great. Um, it gets better. Um, <laughs> life is like that. Life for a while sucks, but then it often gets better. Uh, but, uh, but be careful of STDs. Um, and also, as we said earlier, doing it too much in one day or one night can be a little, you know. Okay, some things get better um, because you learn more. You know, this makes for franchises. I mean, you know, the Harry Potter, why do they make eight movies, not uh, eight movies out of seven books? They realize, hey, you know, we can get another movie here. Um, Star Trek Discovery is unmentionably awful. Um, uh, it is a travesty. Um, Lower Decks is really good. I like Picard. Um, and I like Star Trek more because there's a universe. There's world making. Um, Marvel, same. Um, though the gender dynamics in Marvel are really apparent in looking at that picture. Um, as for the Kardashians, <laughs> unspeakable okay much consumption social only if ever the assumption in the orthodox theory the diminishing marginal utility theory that we've been talking about is that everyone acts the same in society as outside so total demand total social demand is the sum of individual demands people aren't like that this is not the way the world works okay that said within the orthodox theory here we're going to talk as if you're going to amherst college um, or some other good orthodox uh, economics program. Assuming that everyone is alike and no one influences others, aggregate demand is the sum of all the individual demands. And this is how you, know, you form your community demand curve. They usually slide over this really fast. In, um, in Leon Valra, you know, he just kind of like starts with, okay, we're diminishing to marginal utility. And then to get the community, we had a summation sign. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, yeah, everybody's the same. And everybody acts independently. So the sum of individuals is the community. Um, so we only need to know one thing, how one person values things. And then we just multiply the demand curve. 
Um, everyone's the same. Total's the same. Oh, God. Aggregation only works for sociopaths. Our consumption is completely asocial. That's the assumption. Even sex, the number of times you choose to have sex is independent of whether you're doing it with somebody else and how they feel. <laughs> I mean, and then there are other assumptions that kind of sneak in there. We have perfect knowledge. Actually, you don't need perfect knowledge, but you need knowledge that is independent of what you're consuming and independent of what other people are consuming. You don't learn. Um, you know, before when I talked about reading Aeschylus or taking children to museums, that's learning. And learning can lead to upward sloping marginal utility, at least for a time. We're ignoring that. The orthodox theory ignores all that. It also ignores that you're influenced by others. You like the music you like, and it has nothing to do with what other people like, or what other people listen to, as if you live in a show. If that's not true, then aggregate demand curves may not slope down. You may have diminishing marginal utility for an individual, but an upward sloping community demand curve, at least for a while, in which case rising price, raising prices may increase demand. That would be very strange. Life is strange sometimes. Okay, Robinson's, Robinson Crusoe's demand was completely individual, but his life was strange. He was living by himself, at least until he got his man Friday. You know, what's a white man without a slave, really, in 17th century um, England or the Netherlands? <laughs> And of course, when I first read the book, I didn't notice this. Uh, that was 1968, you know. Um, uh, anyway, his demand curve slipped down. He was all by himself. Forget Friday. Okay. In a community, his demand curve may be completely different. Maybe he would buy more to impress his neighbors. We're going to talk about this much more later. Maybe he would value consumption on how much his neighbors will buy. Maybe he would learn from watching what his neighbors are doing. Oh, they're, going to pay, they're paying this much, it must be a good thing. Back to the author. How much would you pay for the third scoop of coconut ice cream? Less than the first, same as the first, more than the first because you found you really liked it. In the orthodox model, less than the first. Don't give me answer two or three. Um, here's how you figure it out. You will pay up to the marginal utility for that scoop. Larger utility is a change in your total utility. First scoop, total pleasures $15. Marginal pleasures, a change from zero to 15. Second scoop, total pleasures $27 for two scoops. The second scoop gives you $12 of pleasure. Three scoops, total pleasures $36. Marginal utility for the third scoop is the change from 27 to 36, or $9. If ice cream costs you $9 a scoop, that'd be good ice cream, and you'll pay three. You'll buy three scoops. The fourth scoop, total pleasure $42, marginal pleasure $6. You won't buy the fourth scoop if ice cream costs $9. Roses. You know, we all know that there's no, nothing in the X chromosomes that lead uh, women to like roses. Nothing in the Y chromosome that men don't, can't like roses. Um, we have a rose bush out there that um, is spectacular. It was planted by a graduate student, uh, whatever, long story. But anyway, um, uh, this summer has been giving us great roses. It's beautiful, I love it. Uh, but if I'm getting towards Valentine's Day or my wife's birthday or her anniversary, I buy flowers. Does she buy me flowers for our anniversary or my birthday? Of course not, I'm a guy. You know, do I buy her flowers? Yeah, she's a girl, <laughs> you know. Uh, so whatever. Anyway, happiness is here. It's not just your individual happiness. It's 
a social thing. You're happy because she's happy or he's happy, maybe, you yeah, know, whatever. Anyway, one dozen roses, $16 of happiness. Ah, one rose, $16 of happiness. You'll pay 16. Two roses, $30.50 of happiness. Marginal utility, $14.50. You'll pay $14.50 for two roses. Keep on going. That 10th rose adds $2.50 to your happiness. If roses go for $2.50 a piece, then you'll buy 10 roses. How much will you pay? How much will you buy? Five? How much ice cream will you buy? At $3, you'll buy five scoops of ice cream. Maybe you'll give one to the dog. Here we go. Um, the fifth scoop gives you $3 of pleasure because you enjoy watching your dog eat ice cream. It's worth $3. You're not going to pay that much. Besides, you may get sick. Um, how much will the community buy? There are 100 people. So you know what? Multiply the number of scoops by 100. $15, you'll buy one. The community will buy 100. $12, you'll buy two. The community will buy 200. $3, you'll buy five, the community will buy 500. Okay, marginal to utilities, a slopes down because of satiation. Try that word out on your friends and family. Individual demand curves slope down because of diminishing marginal utility. That's why we stop eating. If we're not influenced by others, then in aggregate demand curves is some of individual demand curves. Um, and finally, poodles are wonderful. Um, I can stop the share and show you some of my poodle paraphernalia. My wife buys me these periodically for my birthday and things um, because I love poodles. It's my fetish. And this one broke, or the head broke. Cat knocked it over, but whatever. Okay. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Hope you learned. Let me know. And signing out. Bye bye.